So let me tell you about the Leviathan spirit that I saw. Not once, but twice. The second most terrifying experience that I've had uh, demonically was uh, about five years ago with a guy named Mike. And uh, Mike um, worked at the food bank where I was working. Mike was a veteran and uh, I got to know Mike a little bit. Mike had been a surgical assistant um, in New York and uh, he did some pretty hardcore stuff with human blood. Um, when they were doing surgery, he would be called in. He was the guy that cleaned things up. He was the guy that made sure the blood went into the other person's body safely and correctly. And uh, I wonder sometimes, you know, the Bible talks about how you're not supposed to uh, associate with people that are bleeding, not be around blood, women that are going through their menstrual cycle, etc., etc. And uh, the blood is the life. You're not supposed to drink blood. You're not supposed to eat blood. I don't know what, you know, what happened to Mike exactly, but uh, Mike kind of went over the deep end somewhere. And I think he got involved with cocaine, probably got involved with alcohol. He definitely was part of AA uh, at one point. And uh, he had to quit his job. He was going for his PhD. He was gonna become a doctor. And uh, Mike had to quit all that stuff, lost his girlfriend, he had a girlfriend from Tokyo, um, very beautiful. And so I kind of got to know Mike at the food bank. He was put in jail or he was uh, incarcerated because he had gotten involved with a man who was, uh, I guess he was gay. And uh, Mike lived with this guy for about a year and accidentally, he says, lit his house on fire. He was setting a uh, fire in a fireplace or something and uh, something got out of control. Maybe he was drunk, who knows what happened but uh, ended up burning the guy's house down. The guy pressed no charges, but Mike had to go into a special, uh, special program and he had to volunteer at the food bank. And so that's how I got to know Mike. And Mike was kind of a miracle, um, as I found out a little bit later, when the head of the food bank was talking to somebody who was coming through, you know, there was a person doing an article on the, on, you know, the process and everything. He said, oh yes, you know, here's our wall of miracles. And one of the miracles we had, there was a guy who came in and he was uh, doing prayer with one of our prayer people. And the prayer person during 9-11 had donated her Bible, her favorite Bible. And she had signed it and she had, had donated her Bible to people who were in misery because of 9-11. And uh, this guy came in and sat down for prayer. And she said, oh, do you have a Bible? You know, we can pray together. I said, oh yeah. And he pulled his little Bible out. And as she looked at it, she realized that she recognized it. So lo and behold, the Bible that Mike had was the Bible that she had donated in New York. What is that, 20 years earlier or 10 years earlier? And uh, so that's kind of a miracle, you know? What are the chances? One chance in 10 million maybe that that Bible would show up at a food bank when a guy really needed prayer. So uh, that was kind of interesting. So anyway, um, Mike, uh, and I used to go out once a week. We'd go out, we'd have a cigar together, um, and we'd sit down, we'd talk. I got to know Mike quite well over a couple of years. And Mike had housing problems. Um, you know, he didn't have any income coming in and uh, always had landlords that he was, you know, in trouble with. Or um, So I kind of helped Mike out with that a little bit. So one of the common elements that people that seem to suffer from demonic possession or a preponderance of uh, demonic activity is electromagnetic, um, I guess, charges to their body. Uh, that seems to happen. Um, I had one woman that um, I took to the hospital uh, when she was suffering from severe panic attacks uh, that were really, really crippling. And she told me that while she was in the hospital, she had intense electromagnetic uh, problems. She was being electrocuted over and over again. And uh, there was a guy also, this, this is Mike, who uh, also suffered from the same uh, electromagnetic stimulation. You know, he would be zapped continuously. He thought that the CIA, in fact, was 
um, coming after him and you know they were charging him with electromagnetic uh, harp um, charges and uh, zapping his various parts of his body uh, that sort of thing um, but it's very real for these people and in talking to my aunt who's a psychiatrist uh, a lot of people that have suffered from overdoses in um, drugs like cocaine or if they were addicts uh, even alcohol alcoholics sometimes suffer from this problem where they have these electroshock uh, things that happen to them and in both cases of the, of the two people that I know, each of them, um, I had pulled uh, demons out of them. And in the case of Mike, uh, it wasn't just one, it was, you know, there were several. And just one of them was this uh, Leviathan or this dragon or whatever it was that I saw. Mike's housing problems got progressively worse. Um, when I first met him, uh, his apartment was maybe an eight foot by 10 foot room. He had a bare mattress on the floor and uh, he had aluminum foil up on his wall because of the electromagnetic attacks he was having. And uh, he was very, very poor. He had no furniture. He had a little box, a cardboard box with all his belongings in it on the floor. And that's how Mike lived. And uh, so, I prayed for Mike and the first time uh, I prayed uh, in a special way I had, I had listened to somebody who was talking about bringing fire down from heaven you know heavenly fire from the third heaven and uh, I thought I, I wonder if this works I'm gonna let me try it I'm gonna pray for Mike tonight and I uh, did a prayer and I prayed that God would intervene in Mike's life and that I would be able to help Mike in some way and uh, I prayed for good things for Mike, you know, for God's protection and a lot of other things. And I prayed th that God would send his fire from the third heaven down to earth and that he would envelop Mike's room with a ball of heavenly fire and envelop Mike and surround Mike and remove from him any demonic forces that were at work in Mike's life and that he would surround Mike with a feeling of love that and let him know that he loved Mike and uh, that was the prayer you know very simple and uh, what happened was I didn't see Mike until Friday of that week I think I prayed on Wednesday and on Friday we got together in the evening uh, to go into town and have a cigar you know and uh, he said, Tom, he said, I want to tell you something. Something so strange happened to me this week. And he said, uh, I was in my room. I was by myself. I was, you know, looking at my phone or whatever. And uh, suddenly he said the room illuminated. He said the whole room was filled with light. And he said, I was so frightened. I thought I was dying. And he said, I felt the most intense love I've ever felt. I knew at that moment that someone really, really cared about me and really loved me for the first time in my entire life. And he said, I knew it had something to do with you, but I couldn't tell what. And he said, I just want to let you know about that. And I want to thank you if you had anything to do with that. I thought, wow, <laughs> wow. But that's not where the story ends because something happened to me as well. And uh, after I prayed that day or that evening, um, I was sitting back, I was watching TV, um, you know, kind of relaxing and mellowing out. And I was by myself. And as I was sitting there, I saw something that moved into my room, it came right through the wall and it went right past my and I have a huge closet. It covers the whole wall. It's like a 25 foot closet. And this thing passed by my closet and its eye was the size of a manhole cover. <laughs> I mean, it was huge. And I saw this thing go by. I mean, it filled my whole room and it was like the head of a dragon or the head of a leviathan. And it was beautiful. I mean, it was a dark bluish green color. And as it went by, I could see its eye looking right at me. And it kind of looked away and then it looked back at me again. 
and I was so startled, you know, I, and I thought, what was that? Is that a, and I, something was telling me that this was a territorial demon. This was like a demon that was a higher rank and somehow I had infiltrated its territory and it was coming by to see who and what I was. And so, uh, wow. <laughs> But that's not the end of the story either, because, you know, as I sat there, I was, wasn't really afraid. I was kind of afraid, but I wasn't. And uh, later on again, maybe two hours later, as I was getting ready to go to sleep, suddenly, this time at the foot of my bed, I saw this thing go by the other direction. And then again, I mean, this eye was so big, it was bigger than me, you know? And it looked at me and I, it narrowed its eye at me and it's kind of passed again and I saw it go out through the wall again. And I thought, what am I seeing? Why am I seeing this thing? And uh, it was the Leviathan spirit, you know, that had gone through. And I had a choice. I thought, this thing is, it's sizing me up for something, you know? And I decided at that time to go after it. And I remember reading about Job, you know, how God talks about Leviathan. Who, who can lasso or who can harpoon Leviathan? And uh, he doesn't say nobody can do it. He just says, who can do it, you know? If you read it carefully. And so I thought, you know, I, I can sit here and I can be afraid of this freaking thing, or I can go after it. And in my mind, as I prayed, I took myself out into the atmosphere and I rose as high as I could. And I came down with a harpoon in my arm and I, I hit it, you know, really hard. And I felt it, you know, I felt the, the impact. And I was back in my bed and I was laying there and I, I went to sleep, you know, that was it. And I haven't seen it since, but I've seen other things related to Mike as well that were almost as bad. This was bad, but it was beautiful. I mean, it was just so beautiful that it was very moving. You know, it was like seeing Moby Dick or something. Really cool. <laughs> So that's not the end of Mike's saga. Uh, Mike moved out of that apartment, uh, got another apartment, had problems there as well. Um, I prayed the same kind of prayer for Mike at the next place. And again, I was visited, this time not by a Leviathan spirit, by uh, something that I thought looked like a vampire. You know, it, it almost had a cloak. It was very dark and sinister. But I'm assuming that that also was a territorial spirit because it was in a different side of town. It was a, almost a different town. And uh, it's interesting that these things would come to check me out, you know? They were looking um, for me or, or at me. And so uh, it's kind of disturbing. And likewise, uh, Mike and I, like I said, talked a lot at his third apartment uh, where he eventually moved. Uh, he had a lot of trouble with gangs outside. There were guys that, you know, had no shirts on in the, the summertime. There'd be four or five of them. They'd be rough housing. Every time I'd come to bring him food, and I brought him food a lot. You know, once a week I'd bring him a, a thing of food. Sometimes we'd go out and have a, a bite to eat, and he'd bring food back with him. But these guys uh, would harass me. You know, they would, who the hell are you? You know, that kind of thing. You know, what are you doing in this neighborhood? Tough neighborhood. And uh, I got to know one of them, the, the ringleader, um, who was an alcoholic. And I, I actually talked to him about Jesus one day, and I touched him on the forehead. <laughs> you know, don't ask me, you know, why, because it's pretty. He was a scary guy, and uh, he started to cry. You know, he cried like a baby. And uh, apparently, he had been abandoned as a kid. You know, I heard this. His story was horrible, and so he started letting me into the building to see Mike. But I noticed that I had to kind of give him a pay payoff too. I, I would give him a power bar. If I brought Mike a, a whole box of power bars, I would give this guy a power bar. And so anyway, Mike admitted to me uh, that um, he sometimes had demonic, demonic visits. And there was a succubus spirit that would come to him. He said once a week, that would come and he would have a sexual encounter with this thing and uh, that spooked me out quite a bit uh, when I would pray with Mike or sometimes Mike would get in my car and he'd say yeah you know let me let me start a prayer 
And he'd say, you know, dear Michael, dear all-powerful Michael. And I'd be like, dude, you know, who are you praying to? You don't pray to angels. And I'd explain it to him. And uh, Mike's father, as I understand it, was Jewish. Uh, Mike's mother was Roman Catholic. And uh, Mike had some problems as a child, said so there were all kinds of, you know, things, things that happened sexually in his family. I don't know if that's true or not, because other people have told me similar stories. Um, that seems to be a common thread with uh, a lot of these people. And so finally, uh, with Mike, um, about a year or so ago, uh, he tried to set me up with his sister. You know, he sent me a picture of her, said, yeah, she came to visit me. Here's her phone number. Um, so I did call her, but I didn't set up a, a date. What I did was I said, look, you know, I'm a complete stranger and I have now been feeding your brother for the last four or five years. And uh, I said, where's his family? He lives in this skunky place with gangs outside. These guys would come in and steal his medications. You know, he would go to the VA, he'd get medications, he'd come back. Some guy would knock his door down, they'd come in, they'd, they'd pin him, and then they'd take his medication. And so uh, Mike didn't have a very good life there. And she arranged to have her family get together. And Mike is now living in Florida with his father. And uh, so I don't see or hear from Mike very much. He was in a Bible study up here online for a while on, on Zoom, but uh, I have not seen him lately. But it's not the end of the story. You know, it's not a, a success story or a fail story, but uh, like all of us, he's got, uh, you know, a life to live and um, his journey's not over yet. And mine neither. Who knows how it'll end up.